Why Choosing a Niche Will Skyrocket Your Firm, Episode 29. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit-generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Hello and welcome to another episode of Profit with Law and welcome back. So excited to be here and sharing another bomb episode with you. So niche, choosing a niche. This is something I'm really, really passionate about. Uh, When I work with clients, it's one of the first things that we perform exercises on and get really clear uh, really clear on what it is and, and how to execute on it. And I want to um, focus the bulk of this episode on really making the case for you as to why this is so important. And uh, hopefully, by the time that you're done listening, uh, you're going to agree with me. I'm going to spend very a very short period of time at the end of the episode going into how to um, actually execute on this, and perhaps uh, we'll do some more uh, episodes around it because each of, of the exec- execution steps is is a process by itself. But before we get to any of that, it's important to uh, understand, uh, first of all, what what am I talking about when I say niche? And by the way, there's, I guess, niche or niche. There's different ways to pronounce it. I'm not referring to a practice area. So that, uh, although that is a form of, of niching, it is not, it is not uh, niching enough. So let's first talk about how you got to where you are today. Uh, most attorneys, when they hang up a shingle and start their firm, uh, start off as a generalist simply because you're leaving a job usually to start your firm. And um, at that point, you need to earn a living. So you're going to take anything that comes your way. And you're basically going to tell all your family and friends and everybody in your in your uh, network, hey, I started a law firm, I'm, uh, you know, send me anything you got. So you might end up getting, you know, real estate work, some landlord tenant work, some criminal work. Uh, I mean, it the work could be all over the map. And um, at the beginning, you're basically saying yes to everything because you need to earn that money. But you soon come to realize that by saying yes to everything, you're creating a lot of work for yourself that is really not billable because you, you're needing to research the intricacies of each of these, the sp- l- specifics of the law and, and how to draft your documents and, and, and all the steps that you need to take. And when you're trying to figure it out, you can't bill your client for that. So you're only able to bill them for some of the time. So you end up spending a lot of unbillable time and it's a very inefficient way to run. Usually you come to this realization by yourself and at some point you decide that this is going to be the practice area that I'm going to serve in. Now, some people start in a practice area, but you're still a generalist in that practice area where you're either handling everything within the umbrella of that area. So let's say that you're a criminal attorney, you'll take any criminal case that comes your way. Or if you're a personal injury, you'll take any personal injury case that comes your way and so on. You get the idea. You're still a generalist within that practice area. So you're able to say, I am a criminal attorney. You know, we help you get arrested, you know, come to us. Uh, That's it. And when I say to choose a niche, what I'm saying is, is to narrow it down even further than that. Within each of these practice areas, there are very specific either service levels uh, or you know types of service that can be provided that you can narrow into or there are specific audiences so for example a criminal attorney you can say we only handle DWI cases now when you say we only handle DWI cases we're going to get to the the benefits but right away you understand that if somebody gets arrested and they go into Google and they say um, uh, you know let's just say, to New York City. So they put into to Google um, criminal attorney in New York City, and it's going to come up with a gazillion matches for them. They're, it's daunting. They, they can't, really, can't really choose from there. But if you put in DWI attorney or a criminal attorney that handles DWI cases in New York City, that's going to return a much smaller subset of results 
And right away, they're going to be attracted to your firm because that's what you spe you specialize in. Now, I picked a, a really large place in New York City. It could be that there's lots of attorneys that specialize in DWI. And then in that case, you're operating in a bigger C and you need to still make yourself more unique. So, you know, maybe you specialize in a specific type of, of DWI or DUI. Maybe you only do drug cases or maybe you only do you know, you only do cases where it involved a, um, an accident or personal injury, or you only do cases where there was no um, accident involved, you know, and they just got st got stopped for it. I'm not familiar enough with the, spe the specific nuances of that narrow of focus, but I am sure that the more narrow your focus, the more you're going to push away the wrong people and you're going to attract the right people. And that's really where that's really where you start to realize the power of niching down, of getting really specific about who you serve. So now that you understand the difference between a generalist and somebody who has chosen a very specific service, and you understand the specific service is not your practice area, now we can start talking about what are the benefits of doing this? Why should I do this? Why should I say no to, to business? What is, what is the benefit of saying no? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about internal benefits that uh, your firm has, that your firm is going to realize internally. And these are operational efficiencies, ability to close the sale, all of that. So this is all internal. So the first thing is marketing. You are probably spending some effort on marketing, whether it's going to network events, networking events, whether it's paying money to somebody to do your social media or your website, or whether you're active on social media yourself, getting in front of a camera, or uh, you're running radio ads or, or newsprint ads. You're definitely doing something, or you probably or should be doing something in your marketing efforts. So what does this do for us for marketing? Well, it allows us to create one target customer. And when you have one target customer, you can get very, very specific in the language that you use the images or the videos that you use in your ads, the um, the location of where you're running your ads, if you're running ads, or the location where you're, you're, you're showing up. If you're very clear that you deal specifically with um, DWI, then you can you can go to places where, you know, where somebody you know, like you can put your name out, you know, in AA groups, um, things like that, where somebody might fall off the wagon and and now get uh, arrested for a DWI. There is, you know, you can go to psychologists and lots of them have, you know, or programs. And a lot of these programs have, uh, you know, people with with problems that, you know, they're now they're dealing with uh, with these legal battles. So whatever the marketing effort is, you have you have now clearly defined one target customer you're going after, and that allows you to figure out what is the right place to make my marketing efforts. What you know, at, should I be networking? Should I be going after referral sources? Should I be spending money on advertising? If I do, what kind of advertising should I should I be spending it on? Where should I be spending it? Spending that advertising money. And again, you now have the ability to also continually fine tune what you're doing. So you're able to test and see if something works. And if it doesn't work, then you know you need to pivot from there. So either you need to change the language you're using or you need to change the image that you're using or you need to change the medium where you're, where you're advertising your, you know, your firm. So without this kind of focused intensity of who you're trying to reach, you're going to never know if it's not working because you're just in the wrong place or say or have the wrong message or because you uh, you just haven't been running it long enough and haven't had enough people see it because you're so general so um, it really gives you a lot of power in your marketing efforts let's talk about your sales so marketing and sales are two different things even though they're usually lumped together your sales efforts are what happens once your marketing has worked and brought a lead to your door so now what what do you do with that lead so um, what this does is it gives you the ability to uh, create a system around your sales process. If everybody that every lead coming through the door was looking for a different set of services, then you basically would have to spend a lot of your time creating proposals manually or or figuring out in the conversation how much should I charge. And often there's no rhyme or reason as to how you came up with that number other than uh, a 
an assumption that you have in your head without really um, thinking it through of what uh, is going to go into it. That's if you're doing flat fee. If you're doing hourly, then you're, you know, look, listen to my last few episodes on hourly billing and flat fee pricing. Um, you're pushing a boulder up the hill with trying to make a sale with somebody when it's open ended with an hourly rate. Uh, you're much better off coming up with a flat fee model, and this allows you to create flat fee. As a matter of fact, um, by having one specific leading offer, you can start a new client with a very low cost flat fee item that now makes them a client of the firm. And once you deliver on that, they're, they're going to come back to you for the next step. And that's, you know, and then you can grow from there and it becomes a much easier close. You know, imagine you have somebody who is, he just got arrested for DWI and you specialize in DWI, so you know exactly what the process is to get him through arraignment and through a bail hearing and out of jail. And um, and therefore, you have a flat fee for that. And let's say that flat fee is a thousand bucks. So now he's his family is running to try to find a, a, a good attorney, and they call you and they call another attorney that specializes in DWI. Let's say let's say you both have the same competitive advantage. Um, and you give a quote of $1,000 to get him out of jail. And the other attorney says, well, it's going to be a $5,000 retainer and it's going to be $350 an hour, you know, and hopefully it'll be, you know, two, three, four hours to get you out of jail. Well, which one are they going to choose? You tell me. We, we all know that they're going to choose the flat fee, the thousand bucks, and you're going to get that first win for them. And if, you, if you're doing this all the time, you could do it fairly quickly. As a matter of fact, if, if you're the go-to guy for this, then you might have multiple clients at the same time, which means that you're, uh, you're now not, not having any sort of conflict with billing for your time because you're not billing for your time. And you can be in court and knock them all out at once. So um, this is really a, a slam dunk when it comes to your sales process where, where you can make the sale. And... The kicker is that most law firms, the attorney is making the sale. But once you are very clear on what it is that you offer and who you serve, you can now hire a salesperson who's not giving legal advice during the sales conversation. They're simply asking questions about the client, letting them know that you can serve them, letting them know this is the menu, this is what it's going to cost, and closing the deal. And the attorney doesn't get involved until after the, the sale is made the retainer is signed, the payment is made, and you're ready to go ahead and serve the client. All of that can happen without the attorney being involved. And that can only happen if you're very, you're very clear on exactly what you're selling. And that can only happen if you get very specific about the niche that you're serving. Now, can you do this with multiple niches and multiple things? Sure, sure you can. But if you're struggling to grow, then you, by doing this for more than one at a time, you're going to be spreading yourself way too thin and you're not going to be able to complete all the steps required to really get the efficiency out of it. So you might become known for something, but you're not going to be able to deliver the most amazing experience for it, which is going to make you less of the go-to person for it. So the next thing is operations. So we did marketing, we did sales. Now let's talk about operations in, in-house, internally. What does this do for your firm? And this is pretty wild because you're going to start to see where you know the efficiencies are amazing. First of all, on the intake side, you can have a standard process around new client intake. Now I'm sure you already have a process around new client intake. And if you don't, hopefully you will create one, even if you didn't create a niche. But when there's multiple types of uh, directions that a new client can go because of what they, you know, what their particular issue is, the new client intake becomes much more difficult. So you can um, you can create a standard process around new client intake. You can have boilerplate retainer agreements because basically everybody's agreeing to the same thing. So you're just changing you know, their information, their name, their address, you know, this, the signature date. And maybe, you know, if, if you're specifically, if you're specifying the offense in the retainer, you know, then the details of the offense, but basically, and that's, if you know, obviously with our criminal example, I'm, this could work for anybody in any industry, um, any practice area. So that's, uh, you know, so that's what you could do with intake. And the final thing is, is that the, the intake 
process can include starting to gather all the required information that the attorney might currently be talking directly with the client to get. So because that standard set of, of information, required information and documents is, is the same from client to client, uh, you now can make that something that happens w way before the attorney even gets involved. And then the next thing is research. If you're constantly taking on cases or matters that are different than what you, than, you know, than the one before, then you're needing to research the law and or research the specific process that you need to follow and or research the specific drafts and documents that you need to prepare. So there's lots of research that happens in that case. And that research typically is not billable. So not only is it tying up the attorney's time, but it's actually costing the firm money by by, by losing the productivity that could have been there um, had that research not been required. So when you're working on the same exact case and matter every single time, you do that research once and then you, you become knowledgeable in it and you no longer need to do that again. And then all you need to do is stay on top of that one subject area. Drafting. Uh, most documents can be templated and prepared by lower level staff. Doesn't even need to be a paralegal. Once the draft template is created, just a, a basic receptionist or somebody in-house can be preparing those drafts. And then the attorney still does the final review. You want to make sure that you're, you know, that you're that you're sending off something that doesn't have any issues in it. So the the attorney will look at it, but the attorney is not doing any of the drafting process at all. Billing. Uh, the ability to further refine your flat fee billing, you know, can totally remove a huge billing and accounts receivable nightmare. So many firms spend a lot of time on billing, don't have consistency around their billing processes, don't do it around the same time. And then they have accounts receivable issues. They have trouble chasing money, getting people to pay by creating um, a system that can be simplified because clients are all receiving the same level of service. So, you know, you charge a flat fee, you know exactly when it's due, they pay it, and that you only service them if that happens. Then that removes a ton of that overhead, that billing and chasing after money happens when you're um, when you're doing um, all kinds of different things, and therefore every bill needs to be reviewed, every entry needs to be reviewed to to make sure that you're not sending something to the client that is going to end up coming back to bite you. You know, all of that can go away when you have a flat set of services you know, with flat fee pricing, and it, it really simplifies the whole, that whole process. So those are the internal benefits that your firm is going to achieve when you really get focused on a specific niche within your practice area. Now let's talk about the external benefits for a minute, because this is also powerful. Um, when you're working within a practice area, so let's say you're a criminal attorney, every criminal attorney out there is your competition. You're clawing and trying to get cases away from the other criminal attorneys. As soon as you become the go-to person for that type of, of case, suddenly the other attorneys, perhaps they don't like working that case. So let's say it's you know DWI or let's say it's um, sexual assault. If they don't like dealing with sexual assault cases or they're not really up to snuff on all of the laws and they don't have it all perfected down and you are the go-to attorney for somebody charged with sexual assault, then they're going to be referring cases to you because they just don't want to handle it. They want to give it off to somebody who's going to be able to handle it and they would like to keep to the thing that they find comfortable and they find easy. And now as the go-to person for that, as people start sending you those cases, you can actually have some pricing control over what you charge for that because you become the best person for that. So when somebody says, who's the best guy, uh, you know, for this thing, and then they sell, they're t sending them to you, that gives you pricing power as well. So not only is your competition starting to refer cases to you and becomes your referral source, but you also start to uh, become a, you start to become a, a desire in the marketplace that people want, and that is going to uh, further help the growth of your firm. And it works the other way around also. So now that you start saying no to other types of cases, you can start to refer those when they come to you back to your competition. And that creates goodwill, which further escalates the cycle of referrals coming to you. So um, the external benefits are really, really, uh, really good. And, and it also 
and this goes back to the marketing, but it's the the name that your firm is putting out there. Uh, you know, you can your blogs that you that you're writing or having somebody write for you. Uh, listen to our interview just released last week, um, using a freelance writer for your law firm blog with Laura uh, Pennington Briggs. That was episode 28. You know, if you're having a writer write for you and you're trying to build up your SEO traffic, then you're becoming much more specific in this specific area. That's just going to make you rise in the Google rankings for that. So that's going to be a, an external benefit. That's also an internal benefit. So that is the case for niching down. That is why you want to have a niche. You want to choose a niche. You want to get really, really focused on uh, on that niche, and all of your efforts should be going towards that. So this is where I want to uh, talk about how to get started briefly. And again, how to get started, this can be a, t a whole nother episode. I, I'm just going to give you the bullet points so you can start thinking about it. But the first step is it's it's hard to say no. And that's the first um, level of resistance that I get when I work with clients is, you know, how do I say no to somebody who's coming to me with a, with a case that I can perfectly handle, right? And there's two answers to this question. The first is that if, if you proceed with getting really specific on a niche, you don't have to start off by saying no to everything. You could continue to say yes, but only make your efforts in trying to bring a new business around the new niche. Now, the benefit of doing that is that you can overcome your own personal reservations and start making the efforts required, and that eventually you will get to where you need to be. The downside is that it's going to slow you down because you're still going to be spending time, effort, and energy in a different area, and um, you'll basically be... Uh, you ever heard the term, you're seeing the trees and not the forest or, you know, something like that. So you're not seeing the big picture and you have to see the big picture for this to be a success. You have to be able to recognize that this is going to work. And if you have the conviction this is going to work, then you can st from day one start saying no to the other things. That's only going to expedite how quickly referral partners start sending stuff to you because you're sending stuff to them. It's only going to expedite how quickly you become known for something. It's only going to expedite how quickly you get these processes in place because you're saying no to other things, which is creating the room in your firm to serve exactly what you chose to serve. So that's the first thing is, is understand that it's hard to say no and you have two options, two different routes that you can go. Either way, you can still refine what it is that you do and what's the name and, and the face that you put out there. Now, so that's not even step one. That's kind of ground zero. And then step one is to define what it is. You, you need to figure out what is the thing that I'm going to focus on. And again, I'm not going to go into detail of how you do that today, but refer back to previous podcast episode where we talked about your why. And that was episode, episode 21 episode 21 why and that really is it will help you hone in on what is the mission of your firm like what is the purpose what are you trying to accomplish and that will help you figure out what specific area you want to be in so there's two different ways to approach defining what it is you can look at you know what's um, possibly going to be the most lucrative for us it's going to be we're going to be able to create the most systems around the the best flat fee arrangement around and still be able to deliver and make it efficient and make it really profitable so that's one avenue to go and the other is to go for the avenue of you know what do you stand for and what do you want to be busy spending the rest of your life on um, as you build this firm and what do you want to become known for and uh, there's um there's different uh, motivations that people have when they grow their firm. Some people have a motivation specifically around the area that they're working in. So if you're very passionate about the specific area that you're that you're serving because that means a lot to you, then it's going to be easier for you to define what it is than for somebody who just simply wants to be successful to be able to use that money for other, for other philanthropic and uh, impact needs. Then that's more of a money conversation. So there's two ways to approach that. So once you define what it is, then you want to define who your target avatar is. Now, avatar is a, a marketing language. Um, basically, it's it's who is your ideal client. W once you've figured out, you know what 
you do, then you're going to have to figure out, okay, who is it that needs this and what does their life look like? And uh, we can have, we'll have a whole nother episode at some point talking about your target avatar and why it's so important to be clear on this and how do you get clear on it. But you need to define who your target avatar is. And then the next step is to define your marketing plan. So step three, define your marketing plan. And this is really important because without a plan, you're just going to keep dabbling in different areas. And then you're going to say it doesn't work because you're not you're not attracting uh, the business. So if you're very clear on your marketing plan, then you'll be very clear on when it's working or not working. And then you'll be able to be super clear on when it's time to move on to the next step. And, and then you need to create internal processes. So um, at the very least, you need to create the processes around the, the front end, the sales uh, conversation and, um, and the sales presentation. And uh, this will also be another episode in the future where we're going to talk about how to present your, your pricing model to your clients. But basically, you want to have this all pre-canned, pre-prepared so that when you have a sales conversation, you can point the person that you're having the conversation with to a website or to a brochure or share a PDF with them where they can see this is the pricing model. You're not making up something on the fly just for them. And it gives them a lot of conviction in the buying process to be able to move forward with you. So... Um, creating those front end sales processes are really important to be able to start executing on the leads that are coming in. And then from there, you want to quickly fine tune the internal processes so that everybody starts to get the same experience and you start to achieve the benefits of scale as this grows. And then finally, execute. You know, finally, you just want to execute on the plan. You've defined what it is. You've defined your target avatar. You've defined your marketing plan. You've created internal processes. Now go out and do it. You know, Kick off your marketing plan and start bringing in leads and start making those sales and start becoming known for this thing. Let your competitors know that I've decided to get really specialized in what I do. And this is going to, this is my specialty. I'm going to start sending referrals your way. If, if anything outside the specialty comes to me, and if you have anything in this area that you are uncomfortable handling, or you just are too full, too busy, or, or, you know, want to get off your plate, you know, we'd appreciate you sending it our way. And by doing that, you start the conversation of, uh, them knowing that you're no longer their competition and, and, you know, you can now collaborate together. So, just to summarize, as we wrap up this episode, there's a ton of power in getting really, really specific about the service offering that you deliver in your firm. And I went through the internal benefits, the external benefits of what that is. And I also told you how you can uh, get started doing this. Hopefully this was helpful for you. And um, this is really what holds people back. So if you're, if you're trying to grow a solo practice and, and grow beyond yourself, this is absolutely integral for you to do. Uh, if you already have a successful practice and you're, you know, you're in the couple million dollar range, you probably figured some of this out already, but it could be that you didn't get really good at it. Maybe you can get even more specific. This is the power that will help you accelerate to, you know, multiple, multiple millions of dollars. Uh, you, you don't need to add a second niche until you've completely exhausted your market with the niche that you're in. And that doesn't need to happen, uh, you know, until a, a, a pretty, a pretty advanced level of success. So, it's all dependent on where you are, the region you're in, and who you serve. Obviously, if you're able to serve people across the United States, you know, or wherever you're located, I shouldn't assume that people listening to this are in the U.S. I definitely have international listeners. But if your if your practice area is geographically requires requires you to stay within your locality, then that obviously changes the conversation a bit. Uh, you know, as far as how big is the market, and you know how niche should you get. But if you're able to, if you're able to expand beyond beyond your immediate geographic area for the thing that you do, then that really makes this a limitless opportunity. So, uh, all things to consider as you enter into this exercise. But I challenge you to just take. 30 to 60 minutes and think about this and think about what is it that you want to do? Go back and listen to episode 21 and figure out why you're in this, you know, what you want the mission of your firm to be, and then take that and, and translate that into, into what you do. And, and let's see what this turns into. So of course, if you need help doing this, we, you know, we do coaching here and, and consulting and we're happy to consider working with you. Just uh, shoot me an email. Uh, ask me your questions. We can set up a free discovery call. The email address is mamsel at dreambuilderfinancial.com. I'll spell it for you. M-A-M-S-E-L 
at D-R-E-A-M-B-U-I-L-D-E-R-F-I-N-A-N-C-I-A-L-C-I-A-L.com. And that will be in the show notes as well. Show notes can be found at ProfitWithLaw.com forward slash zero two nine. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Until next time, let's make those law firms profitable. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.